Well, hello, and I welcome you to another exciting episode of Pens in Use. This is the show where I talk about the fountain pens and inks that I'm using this week. So let's dive into it. So if videos like this interest you where I talk about fountain pens both old and new, I'd invite you to subscribe. And if you'd like to comment on any of the pens or some of the surprises coming in this video, please feel free to leave a comment down below. So let's take a look at the pens. So first, I have my Geha Boy, and I wrote it empty, so we're going to try out the ink tank on it. I have my Parker Slim Fold. I have a Bayor 688, or is it 288? 388, wow, totally messed that up. Next to it, the pen that inspired it is a Parker Sonnet. I have a Parker Vacuumatic, I have a Parker Frontier, I have a Pilot, which I'm not sure what its model number is, and I didn't look it up because the writing experience will be not very piloty because the person who gave it to me has a wing sung nib on it. I have a Parker Jotter, and I have a Parker 45. So let's take a look at how they write. As always, I'm using my uh, BOMO art journal. And down below, any of the pens that I've reviewed before, I'll have links to them. And it's few enough here. It's possible I'll even use the informational thingy that you can put up in the corner. So let's see how they write. So let's begin with the Geha Boy. This is a school pen from Germany, the 1960s most likely. Uh, I have mentioned before I wasn't sure about the green, but uh, apparently the green is natural to the pen. Boy is not a typical German word for, you know, what a boy is in English, but it is a word used in English. Um, a German, no, I believe Austrian viewer suggested that it's possible uh, that this was due to the English language influence in Germany that it got this name. So I was writing with this pen last night. I, uh, one of my pen pals got a letter written entirely in Parker Quink Blue. And as you can see, I wrote it empty. Well, almost empty. Okay, I promise last night it was not writing. There we go. That's what I was waiting for. So, back here. Ooh. Is a little switch. It was down like that, and I think it switched itself, which is interesting. Didn't see that coming. So, I guess you don't get to see it in action. Well, that's disappointing. But at the same time, instructive. I may have also switched it while I was in the process of capping it. I don't know. But... Just uh, in case anybody missed that, the switch can be up. Or, the way it's been this whole time, down. I'm going to just go out on a limb and guess that the up position is where it releases the extra ink. I don't know that, though. So, interesting. Topic to pursue an another time. Okay, so uh, I may have just smurfed my face. Uh, I'm down in the basement where I record this, but I use a, fan, a blower fan to circulate air. Uh, I blow it up to the hot bathroom and kitchen. And uh, so this basement is warm and I was sweating. And uh, yeah, I may have just smurfed my face with Parker Quink. Luckily, it's washable blue. Oh, I should tell you what I'm using next. So my next pen is a British pen. From, or I should say from the UK. Uh, this is a Parker Slim Fold. It, uh, there's no finial there, but I, apparently the finial would have been a chunk of plastic the same color as the body. It's a slender little pen. You know, with a name like Slim Fold, I guess it has to be. 14 karat nib, made in England. I actually have a video in the process about this pen. It has the same sort of a filling mechanism as a Parker 51. 
and I am told that it's somehow related to the Parker Dual Fold, which is a topic I'll expand upon when I review the pen. Now, I don't know what size nib this pen has. As you can see, there's nothing except a 5 written on the nib, and the 5 is not is just telling you that it's for this particular model of pen. But looking at the writing, I would go with a broad, although Parker seems to run wide, so it could even be a medium. So I'll just leave the nib place blank. This is KWZ, Iron Gall, Violet, Violet number two. That little pause there actually gave us a little time to see the difference in color, but I'll try to remember to come back. So I'll lay the pen right above the notebook, so hopefully it sticks in my mind. My next pen is a Bayor 388. This is a, a Chinese offering that is related to the Parker Sonnet, and I thought it would be interesting to compare this to the Parker Sonnet. So we're getting a look at the nib here. There, focus on that and then look at the nib. So Bayor, feed type thing. And just like the Sonnet, it's a cartridge converter pen. I don't know the nib size. I'm leaning toward medium or fine. And I don't even know that this is the correct pronunciation. I've heard Bayor and I've heard Bauer. And I don't know which one is right. Uh, the ink in it is, uh, I bought a whole set of these samples actually last summer, and I never got around to testing them. You know, I had the idea of doing a big video where I compare all these inks, which I may yet do. Uh, I've got another big review project I'm doing, though, so I don't know. But uh, Sailor Story of Balloon Green. But I bought a full sample set of all of them. They are uh, Sailor's pigmented inks, which means they're made out of uh, su suspended particles rather than the dye inks like a more traditional fountain pen ink. This is the Parker Sonnet. You've seen it before. Uh, one thing I'll just point out, Chris Rapp 52 did a video where he reviewed his and pointed something out. This is uh, apparently an adapt, uh, a little piece that makes this pen work well as a rollerball. And he mentioned a difficulty with uh, getting his converter to fit. Uh, but he had the uh, twist Parker converter. Yeah, there we go. There's the more traditional Parker um, converter. And anyway, apparently he couldn't get it to fit, which, you know, when this one runs empty, I'll be curious to try it. Anyway, this is a medium nib since I showed you the nib on the other guy. Come on. Apparently shiny things are difficult to focus on. So nice nib, nice feed. I've been finding that I really, really like this pen a lot. But that brings up a good question. What's better, the original Sonnet or the Clone? I think down the road I need to do a full video review on both. I will say that this finish isn't what you find on Sonnets now, but you look back in the past, you'll find similar finishes like this. Uh, what I found on the Bayor, the nib just isn't as nice. It's a little, lot more uh, scratchy, which it can be smoothed. Uh, the other thing I'm finding is that the gold plate is actually kind of wearing or chipping off in various places. Or oxidizing, maybe 
that's what it's doing. Anyway, uh, well, time will tell if the Parker does that. My next pen will be an upcoming review. I promised it before and then I set it aside because I was waiting for a, a Chinese pen to compare it to that would show how the filling mechanism works, but they sent me the updated version, so I, I'm just going to go ahead and do it. So, Parker Vacuumatic. I don't know what the nib size is on this pen. Whoops. So we'll go with uh, extra fine because it seems to be extra fine. Wow, E, F, not E, E. Extra fine. And the ink in it is KWZ. Iron Gall, green number four. It doesn't show the same cool Iron Gall thing that the violet does. It's, you know, just a plain dark green. Then I have a Parker Frontier. I told you last week that this is a, a version of the pen I had. Now when I looked this up, this model was discontinued several years ago, and, but it is related to the Sonnet. So when I do the review of this, I, I have the links down in my notes, so I will put all them in my review of this pen. But uh, apparently I got hold of some old stock. Now this is, you just saw it, a fine nib. Sure doesn't look fine to me. I mean that's broader than the medium sonnet. Oh, it's broader than what I thought was a broad slim fold. Is Birmingham. Cathedral of Learning, which is a neat concept. You know, not knowing what it is, but I'll get to that in a second. And it looks a lot darker in person than it does on my camcorder, so I don't know what it'll do on your screen. But anyway, uh, apparently the Cathedral of Learning is a very tall tower on the, what is it, University of Pittsburgh campus? I want to say University of Pittsburgh. I looked at some pictures. It looks like a really cool place. I mean, it's very cathedrally and learning ish um, I don't know. I, I want to research the building a little bit more, but I want to thank the viewer who told me what that is because it gave me a direction. Uh, I just like the idea of a cathedral of learning, you know, a place that where learning is valued rather than Oh, so we gotta learn. I don't need no learning. All right, next pen was a gift from a viewer. I, I did a, an unboxing many months ago, actually. This was one of the pens that appeared in that unboxing. It's a, park, a Pilot. I don't know the model number, and I didn't bother looking it up because it doesn't have an original Pilot nib. Instead, it has a Wing Sung nib, Super quality, though, so that's good. And a feed kind of like a Pilot Metropolitan. So I suspect it's uh, related to the Prera. It may be like a predecessor of the Prera. Maybe it's one of the colored Preras. I, I've never really... Uh, I've only ever owned one Prera, so I don't know. That's a good thought. I didn't think of that till just now. Well, not stopping the story for now. We'll just put pilot question mark. I'll look it up for next week. It's a fine. And I have Iroshizuku. And I have to say this is writing well. Konpeki. Which is a very attractive shade of blue. And at least on my camcorder is more closely matching what I'm seeing on the paper. And I did white balance, don't worry. I just did this review this week, and this has become my daily writer for a while because uh, the senator ran out of ink. I will say this isn't ever likely to be my daily writer. It's a decent pen. I might take it with me if I'm traveling. 
So this is a Parker Jotter medium. And again, finer than the Frontier. And the ink in it is Parker Quink Black. One nice thing, I have, I could put a converter in it, but if I use cartridges, Parker cartridges are generally easy-ish to find. Here, at least here in the U.S. I don't know about internationally. They're not quite a standard size converter. And my last pen, which I almost misnamed in my intro, is a Parker 45. And I am doing a batch review of a whole bunch of pens this weekend. This is one of them. Uh, the nib in it, I don't actually know. But I see an X there. Which I might have to look that up. I don't recall running across anything like that from my uh, notes. Um, as far as I can see, it's a fine nib. I'll put an X here too. Just so I remember to look that up. And the ink in it is KWZ Grapefruit, which if you're looking for an off-red to correct papers with, that's actually a very nice ink for doing that. All right, before I turn to other topics, let's go back to the Parker Slim Fold for a second. Uh, this is that Iron Gall Violet ink, and just because I think the color change is so cool, let's write Violet. And that is how much the color changes in the course of me filming one video. Admittedly, with some time edited out because I pause or I look things up or whatever. But, And probably you can already see the color changing as you watch. So yay, I finally remembered to compare the colors. Part of the fun of an Iron Gall ink. I'll zoom this out the full way because I've got a couple of things I want to show you. Uh, one of them, I got a letter from a... A fan. Now I will, uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say her name, so I'll just say this is a fan from somewhere in Europe. So sent me an interesting letter that's in a folder and then they made a notebook out of it. And then there were some neat little bookmarks and things. This is the kind of stuff I don't have a concept about, it just never occurs to me. But they made a neat folder. So that was kind of cool. I read through their letter. Um, one of the things they included was some lavender in a little pouch of lavender. Oops, I left some leaves on my notebook. Oops, okay, I'm making a mess. Uh, but she suggested that lavender would suit my house. Um, I don't know if uh, she realizes what color my house is. It's Frosty Margarita. But, uh, hey, maybe it would go well with Frosty Margarita. Who, go, who knows? But the other neat thing, I don't know if this was intentional or if this just happened by accident, but does that shape look familiar to you? Okay, maybe not because it's the least visited state in the United States, but that shape sure means a lot to me. Sure looks a lot like this state. Yes, this is North Dakota. I printed this at school on a 3D printer. Uh, I was experimenting. I printed for the fourth grade teacher two of these. I tried one, the way the pattern is, was upright like this, and then the other, then I tried laying it flat. I gave her the flat one because it doesn't have these stupid lines on it, and uh, the edges are a lot smoother. So I kept the crappy one, sorry, the junky one for myself. And so, yeah, that looks... Kind of like it's meant to look like North Dakota. It could be it's just my imagination. But, you know, we have the Red River. goes along this border. And uh, all the other borders are square in this state. And if you're interested, I live somewhere down in this neighborhood. Uh, the highest point in North Dakota is down in this neighborhood. I... I'm not 100% sure which of these dots is exactly it, but probably this one because it feels the highest. And it just, there's a couple other features there that seem right, but it might be this one. I, I, I need a little bit more landmarks to tell. 
uh, over. I, I was in Rame, North Dakota, which is somewhere over here. Uh, Rame is the highest town in North Dakota, altitude-wise. Um, White Butte, by the way, is the highest point in North Dakota, and that's a short drive from my house. <laughs> um, let's see, over here in this valley, this is the Little Missouri River. Uh, this is Badlands over here, and you can kind of tell it's bad, man. Kind of rugged, but the, the Little Missouri runs up here. And somewhere up around uh, Williston, it joins up with uh, the Missouri River and the Yellowstone River. The Yellowstone River barely carves a corner out of North Dakota somewhere over here. And uh, there's actually sugar beet farming over there, which is mostly found on the east coast of the state. Okay, we don't have coasts in the state. Eastern edge of the state. Uh, but, you know, our national park, the Teddy Roosevelt National Grasslands, are kind of in the badlands here. Uh... I don't know what this is. I feel like it's a mistake because it is the highest thing on the map. But the highest point in North Dakota is down here. So I don't know what this... I think this is a programming error. They, you know, to do a state in a way that can be stored in the memory of a 3D printer, they just have to cut details out. And, you know, when I show you Pennsylvania, you'll, you'll, you'll know what I mean. <laughs> All right, so a little Missouri... Or I'm sorry, the Missouri comes down this way, flows out... Uh, there is actually a Lake Sakakawea in here, which is not on the map. And, uh, of course, Bismarck is somewhere down in this neighborhood, sort of in the southern, or in the south-central part of the state. Uh, hard to get it exact. And then Interstate 94 basically goes across, like, oops, basically goes across on the lower edge of the state. I'm a, about an hour south of the interstate. Fargo is over here. Uh, Jamestown and Valley City are somewhere in here. Uh, up this neighborhood is Prairie Pothole Country, which is very swampy. You'll see a lot of small lakes or sloughs, a lot of duck hunting. Um, these are the Turtle Mountains, which are forested. True story. Uh, you'll also find the Turtle Mountain Indian Reservation there. Somewhere down around here is Devil's Lake, which is a uh, Named after Spirit Lake, which was the original Native American name for it. Um, so to my not surprise, I just, the battery in that camera, the big camera, just died. And, yeah, so we'll finish this up without you ever seeing me again. Uh, I'm not sure what this is. I want to say it's the Cheyenne River. You know, somewhere up here is Harvey, North Dakota, which if you saw my video about my teaching career, you'd know I lived there for a while. Uh, this here, I'm going to go with Pembina Gorge, which is forested also and gorgeous. Uh, Grand Forks is somewhere around here. Like I said, Fargo's here. And you'll notice, flat as a board. Very flat part of the state. Uh, I used to live in West Hope, North Dakota, which is somewhere... Think, yeah, somewhere in here. I think this is the Mouse River coming down, which we called the Surus River. It goes by different names for different people. Uh, Minot is somewhere down here. Uh, it loops somewhere somewhere around Minot and comes back north past West Hope. Uh, I lived in Turtle Lake for a while, which is more kind of in this country, kind of in Prairie Hole Pothole Country. Prairie Pothole Country. So, uh, you know, it's not as flat a state as you would think. Uh, definitely higher here than Pennsylvania, especially where I live. But at the same time, definitely uh, flatter than Pennsylvania. And yes, what since this was vertical, I just had to do a Pennsylvania map, so don't tell my boss. So I, most of you probably know that I grew up in Pennsylvania and then somehow ended up in New York or in uh, North Dakota. Well, this is Pennsylvania. So uh, Susquehanna River kind of comes down here. Harrisburg is at the edge of the Allegheny Mountains. You can see the ridges that make up the Allegheny Mountains. I lived a couple of mountains north of Harrisburg near uh, Peters Mountain in a little town called Halifax for about 10 years. Uh, I did not graduate from there, but uh, I lived there from what time I was four till the time I was 14. I lived for a little while, sort of in this neighborhood, the first four years of my life, right 
and I mean seriously, right on the New York State line, near a little town called Honeyoy. Uh, and then I graduated from a high school down here called Countersport Junior Senior High School. Um, I'm ashamed to admit I'm less familiar with Pennsylvania geography than I should be. Um, Poconos are over here, I know that. Philadelphia is down in this neighborhood. Um, you know, borders on New Jersey and Delaware, New York State down there. West Virginia and Virginia. I don't know, I don't think we border on Virginia. West Virginia and Maryland. Sorry, got my states messed up. I watch a channel where he talks, he goes to West Virginia, Virginia, and Pennsylvania a lot, but he's in Maryland, so he can do that. Uh, Ohio over here. This is Erie. This is, um, is it Prescott Isle? Anyway, there's a little tail that comes off near Erie, Pennsylvania. And somewhere down here is our only seaport in Pennsylvania. North Dakota, for some reason, doesn't have a seaport, but Pennsylvania did. And, uh, yeah. So, use my 3D maps. So, uh, I don't have anything else real exciting to bring. Oh, actually, I do. I do, I do, I do, I do. I told you about this last week. This is a book about Hattie Fuller. She lived in Rame, North Dakota from about 1916 to 1946 as the editor of the Rame paper, lived as a man. So I got, the book just came, so you know I'm only that far into it, but I've been reading it, so I'll have an update for you. But she has, you know, there's a family photo. Um, the author of this book is right there. This is the dad, I think it's the dad, of the Hattie Fuller, I'm not sure. Or it could be her father. Eh, he looks too old to be her father. I'm not sure. Okay, I'll have to read the book to know. Um, but, you know, to answer some of the questions I had, here is Cappy, uh, the, after Hattie started living as a man, right there. With, uh, I guess, family? It says pal. I don't know if that's a name. Again, I'll have to read it. Let's see, where else? I saw a few pictures. I'll have, I'll have to do like a video on the book. Oh, you know what? That might have actually been Hattie's father. Not Lois's father. Said, got to read it. Uh, as far as I can tell, it's so far it's been written in the first person by Hattie, as Hattie Fuller talking. There we go. Wedding picture. That's uh, Hattie Fuller living as Cappy and Inez, the wife. And then this is Hattie Fuller still living as a woman. Uh, the part I'm at right now, I'm still in chapter one, but it's talking about going to see a doctor. I think maybe the reason Hattie Fuller quit editing the paper is sickness. They're going over to Baker, Montana to the doctor and the friend helping, it doesn't actually know. Here is a picture of the whole family. Um, okay, Fred. Oh, Hattie, that must be Hattie. So, anyway, just kind of getting started on it. So, if you're looking for a, a read about, like I said, I don't know how, the, how uh, Hattie Fuller got away with that for almost 30 years without anybody finding out. But, very cool. So, that's why I dragged this book downstairs. So, I'll leave you there. Uh, if videos like this interest you, where I talk about lots and lots of fountain pens, or, you know, I also review fountain pens, please feel free to subscribe. If uh, you'd like to comment on anything I brought up, whether it be the disappointment of the ink reserve on the Geha Boy, or Hattie Fuller, or the state where I live, please feel free to leave a comment. And as always, I thank you for watching. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.